H1 is a gene that we all have. Um, it's a gene that is associated with preventing cancer from developing. We all actually have two copies of the CDH1 gene because we get one copy from mom and one copy from dad. But it only takes one copy to not work properly because it has a pathogenic variant to increase the risk of cancer. Um, and CDH1 increases the risk of both gastric cancer and breast cancer. Um, so that's CDH1 in a nutshell. A little bit more information about CDH1 is when it works properly, it makes sure that our cells adhere to each other correctly. So it's really important to the architecture of our cells and our tissues. And so when the CDH1 gene has a pathogenic variant, it can't create its protein or it creates a dysfunctional protein. And the CDH1 creates the e cadherin protein. And so if the e cadherin protein can't do its job as far as maintaining the cell adhesion and the structure of our cells, that can cause tumors to grow into metastasize. And so CDH1 is a tumor suppressor gene. We want it to work correctly. When it doesn't, it increases the risk of cancers. The specific cancers that it increases the risk for is gastric cancer and breast cancer. Um, as far as the risk of gastric cancer and breast cancer, that's what we looked at in our penetrance study that came out in JAMA. Um, we really wanted to look and see in a large data set that we had, um, and we collaborated, NCI is where I work, the National Cancer Institute, we collaborated with other institutions so that we can um, gather a large data set of individuals with uh, and families with pathogenic variants in CDH1. Initial gastric cancer estimates came out around a little over 20 years ago in 2001. And what they found was up to an 83% risk of gastric cancer in women and 67% in men. And that risk in, in subsequent studies has decreased over time. However, clinicians and some patients still kind of hold on to that notion that the risk for gastric cancer is extremely high with um, having a pathogenic variant in CDH1. More recent estimates that came out in 2019 came out of laboratories who were doing genetic testing. Something called gene panel testing has become more popular in the last 10 years. That's when they look at several genes based on one indication. And when it comes to cancer genetic testing, the majority of people get tested because of breast cancer risk. And so, meaning they have breast cancer that is diagnosed young in them, um, they may have a family history of breast cancer or a combination of both of those things. That's still the main indication for cancer genetic testing. And so the, the laboratories in 2019, um, two labs, they found that the risk was much lower than those initial estimates because the ascertainment, the reason for testing was different most of the time. Many people, the main indication was breast cancer and there was not a strong family history of gastric cancer. Um, whereas the initial studies, the one that I mentioned with up to 83% risk, there were three or more cases of gastric cancer in those studies. So of course, you're going to find a higher risk in those families. Again, there was that ascertainment bias. There was less of that in the studies from 2019. They found around 33 to 42% lifetime risk for gastric cancer. Our study that um, we um, recently published found an even lower estimate. The studies from 2019 had around 40 families that they were analyzing. Our study, our multi-site study had 213 families, so the largest data set so far. And we found a lifetime gastric cancer risk of 10% in men and 7% in women.
The lower risk estimate, one of the reasons is because of the larger data set, not that ascertainment bias. So people undergoing genetic testing because of the breast cancer um, indication. And then also our study did something a little differently from the previous penetrant studies. We really wanted to focus on uh, clinically relevant gastric cancers, gastric cancers that warrant treatment um, with surgery and chemotherapy, for instance. So those are considered T1B or higher um, in, the, in the grading system of, of gastric cancer. And so the reason why we did that is because we know that people who have CDH1, who have opted for risk reduction to prevent gastric cancer, they um, undergo gastrectomy, removal of the stomach. And several studies have shown that when asymptomatic people undergo gastrectomy because of CDH1 to reduce their risk, that almost all of them, um, between 90 to 95% will have insolent, non-life-threatening, occult T1A gastric cancer. So we know that almost everyone has these cells in their stomach that are laying dormant. So we have that data point. But we really wanted to understand the um, risk of advanced gastric cancer that becomes clinically relevant and candidates for treatment. So our study did focus on T1 and B and higher, whereas the other studies did not tease that apart. However, even with our study, we did do a secondary analysis, including all stages of gastric cancer, and that just doubled the risk. Um, it took it up to 13 to 19 percent versus 7 to 10 percent. So it about doubled the risk, but still, no matter what, it was much lower than the initial estimates from 20 or so years ago, and still even lower than the studies from 2019. And so the stats involved in our studies really did um, rigorous uh, adjustments for ascertainment bias as well. So all of those factors combined um, are part of the reason why the risk is lower than previous estimates. That's a great question and something that um, I was asked even after the 2019 penetrance estimates came out from those two labs. Um, and so what we used to think, again, was that very high up to 83% risk for gastric cancer. So the first um, pathway, the first option that was given to people was removal of the stomach. Gastrectomy was recommended. Um, and so as we know over time that the risk is, is lower, we have to rethink um, who are the best candidates for, for gastrectomy. It used to be gastrectomy, and then if it was declined, upper endoscopy. But now we're taking a more measured approach. We're thinking through and, and really getting information about the family history, um, who's been affected, who hasn't been affected with cancer, how big is the family, um, are people living long or their early death? There's a lot to take into account with the family history. Um, but if we aren't seeing a strong family history and then upper endoscopy for screening, which should include random biopsies, seems to be an approach that is can be offered to people in addition to gastrectomy. Um, gastrectomy is still on the table, even with these lower risk estimates, because compared to the general population, the risk is still significantly elevated, a 33-fold increased risk. And we don't know why endolin cancer advances. We don't know the triggers. People can still be caught off guard with gastric cancer, even if they in advance gastric cancer, especially if they're not undergoing the recommended screenings, if they have CDH1 or if they have a family history of CDH1 and, and have elected not to be tested, people should be screening because if they don't screen, they can still be caught off guard because we don't understand why some people live till 80 and never develop gastric cancer. And then some people get diagnosed um, at a young age unexpectedly.
So both options should be presented with the discussions of the risk benefits and limitations of both. So interestingly, in our study, we did look at those families that had a strong family history of gastric cancer, um, three or more relatives. And in those families, we did find a higher risk. We found that the risk was about 38% lifetime risk. And so because of that, that really speaks to the fact that in some families, there likely are some genetic modifiers that are making the risk higher beyond CDH1, because our genes don't work in a vacuum. You know, they interact with, with other genes within our genome. And so it definitely needs to be studied further. When it comes to environmental factors, we have a, a good number of um, relatives in our data set of our study who are CDH1 negative, who don't have the pathogenic variant in the family. And we didn't see any gastric cancers in those families and in those individuals who tested negative. And so you would think their shared environment between the individuals from the same family who are CDH1 positive versus negative. Um, and so perhaps environmental components aren't strong, That our study hints to that. Our study also hints to the fact that there may be other genetic components, but definitely needs to be studied further. So when individuals find out that they carry a pathogenic variant in CDH1, a key component of the education is letting them know the cancer risk and what are the management guidelines and what are the recommendations for genetic testing for relatives. And so because there are, it's very dynamic, our understanding of the cancer risk of CDH1, um, and new studies have come out, our study and then the studies in 2019, it's very important to keep patients up to date of the current risk estimates. Oftentimes patients are online, you know, doing their own, re own research and often edu educational materials that are online are not up to date. It, it can take a while for them to incorporate this new data into educational resources. Um, and, and even into test reports, many genetic test reports provide educational fact sheets that accompany the report. And those sometimes take a while to incorporate in information. So in providing genetic counseling, making sure to provide patients with the most up-to-date in, um, information about cancer risk estimates, because that can help them with their informed decision-making. Also, when it comes to gastric cancer in the family, sometimes it, it's referred to as stomach cancer. And when it comes to stomach cancer, many people report anything that's in the abdominal cavity as stomach cancer. So a gastric cancer, some families could be overreported when it's really a colon cancer or a pancreatic cancer, or it can be underreported as well. People think their relative had colon, but in reality, they had a gastric cancer that spread um, within the abdomen. And so because of that, when someone tests positive and because we know family history can impact risk, it's important to facilitate helping to track down pathology reports if possible and death certificates, those type of things, because um, it can help patients make decisions. And then also helping patients to um, cope with the information, letting them know that this does not mean they'll definitively get cancer. It's a risk factor, it increases their risk. And there are measures um, and including screening, that is a reasonable option for them because some patients do feel anxious or rush to surgery um, to gastrectomy when they test positive for CDH1. And it's really important to make sure patients talk to different providers with expertise in CDH1 um, as they are making their decision on medical management. And it's not a decision that has to be made up right away. It could be made over time. So supporting patients during the decision-making um, process. Um, so the recommended screening for someone who tests positive for CDH1 is annual upper endoscopy 
um, with random biopsies, at least 30 random biopsies, because we know the stomach lining could look just fine. The stomach mucosa can look fine, but there can be cancer cells hiding underneath. So that's why don't just look for any mucosal abnormalities. You need to do random biopsies and again, at least 30 and that's annually. Um, so when it comes to cancer screening in general, yes, there are um, disparities and there are barriers, um, especially for people who are uninsured or who are underinsured. And we know that um, it can, that can be an issue for people who are lower income, um, for certain people who are from particular ethnic backgrounds. And so in general, there are disparities in cancer outcomes as far as people not getting the recommended screenings, even just general population cancer screenings because of issues, um, financial issues. And then for certain populations, issues related to um, not feeling comfortable going to the physician or to see a healthcare provider because of past abuses and, and mistrust that has developed over time um, because of historical um, abuses in certain communities. So it's very complicated. So there definitely are barriers, um, but it's important to talk about your family history. That's the first step with your family members, you know, share information with your relatives. There's lots of secrecy when it comes to diseases in general in some families or people feel like they don't need to tell their relatives that's private. Um, but we're learning more and more that this information um, affects our relatives because we have the same biology. Um, almost all diseases have some genetic component. Some are more strong than others. Um, and so it's important to share any um, diseases such as cancer, heart disease, diabetes, with your family members so that they know what they're at risk for and they can report that information to their providers and then be referred to genetic testing if it's indicated. 